comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 28. Acts 2, 22 through 28. I'll be reading from the New King James. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by determined by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and have put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. In 1 John 2, beginning in verse 15, Apostle John there says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but... He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let me tell you one of the most difficult questions that you'll ever ask an American citizen in today's world. What do you need? You ask someone. You pick your average American and you ask them, what do you need? You know what they're going to say? I don't need anything. I've got clothes on my back. I've got money in my pocket. I've got a checking account. I've got a savings account. I have a wife at home. I have healthy children. What do you need? By and large, the devil has convinced us through the pride of life that we need absolutely nothing. That we have everything that we could ever want or desire. And if we don't have it, there's this device called a credit card that you can go get virtually anything you want instantly, right? Now, the devil has convinced us of that. And when we see all these things, we get a little confused about the meaning of life. Does life have meaning? Well, certainly it does. Well, what's the meaning of life? Boil it down, fear God and keep his commandments. Boiling everything down. Well, what about the Bible? Does the Bible have a theme or something that runs through it that tells us its meaning? Well, indeed it does. What is the purpose or the meaning of the Bible? Boiling everything down, the salvation of mankind through Jesus Christ. Now, what do you need? Do you need food? That shouldn't be a problem. Do you need a friend? That shouldn't be a problem. What do you need? I promise you. You need forgiveness. You need your sins remitted by the blood of Christ. That is what we need. We're going through some great chapters of the Bible. And now we've made it to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the hub of the Bible. Well, what do you mean by hub of the Bible? Well, I mean this. It is the center or focal point of the entire Bible. Well, now you're making fun of the cross. You're belittling the cross of Jesus Christ. No, I'm not. I'm not. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, here is its culmination. The preaching of that one gospel to let people know, here's what you need. You stand in need of forgiveness and you can have it. You can have the forgiveness of your sins. So today... We're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Today's sermon we choose to entitle it, the hub of the Bible. There are three things we're going to observe in today's sermon. They're all going to start with a P. In Acts 2 verses 1 through 13, we're going to see 
preparation. We're going to see the preparation of the apostles. They were empowered to go preach the word. And then we'll see the preparation of the people initially to whom they preached. Those miracles that they witnessed helped soften their heart. So when that message hit, it was ready to hit an honest and good heart. And let that seed come forth. That's number one. Number two, we're going to see some preaching. We're going to see how to preach effectively today. Maybe I won't, but this will. Acts 2, verses 14 through 36, we're going to answer the question, how do I call on the name of the Lord? Did you know the Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved? Now, we know what the world says, how to call on the name of the Lord. What does the Bible say? So we'll answer that question in point number two. And then number three, it's going to be two Ps, but one point, pardon and placement. Do you need pardon? Do you need forgiveness? Yes. Well, when you are pardoned, you are placed somewhere by the Lord himself. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. So that's what we intend to do. Now let's get started. Let's open our Bibles up to Acts chapter 2. And we will not be able to read every verse. We'll read a lot. We will not be able to draw out everything in one sermon, but we will some. Okay? Let's go ahead and get started. Number one, let's talk about the preparation here of the apostles. And we'll see the Feast of Pentecost is when all this is taking place. Pentecost is what is, it is referred to in Acts 2, but throughout the Old Testament, it has a few other names. You'll see it called the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of First Fruits. Pentecost means 50th. Pentecost occurred seven Sabbaths, and then on the morrow, the Sabbath was always Saturday, so Pentecost always took place on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is Sunday, not Saturday, nor Monday, nor any other day. So Pentecost occurred 50 days after the Passover. Now we'll see here that the apostles and only the apostles are those who underwent baptism within or of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what the Bible says in Acts 2.1. Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, it's all the way Sunday, they... They who? You go back and check. It is the 12. The 11 plus Matthias is who is under consideration here. That's it. They, the 12 apostles, were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound. Doesn't say a, a wind. What came was a sound, but watch it. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, it the sound, filled all the house where they, the apostles, were sitting. And there appeared unto them, the twelve apostles, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. That's only the twelve. Some people will try to make this the 120. It won't work. It won't work. This is only for the twelve. And verse number four. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now one thing we have to make clear. Miracles happened. Miracles happened. Every, let me tell you something about the church of Christ. We believe in every miracle in the Bible. This was miraculous, as we'll see. And there are other miracles that occur, occurred through this chapter. But do miracles still occur? The answer to that is no. They served their purpose. They were temporary. They happened. They occurred. But they do not occur today. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what happens? The apostles began to speak with other tongues. Now this, to some of our religious friends, this we'll see the, how the Bible defines the usage of the word tongues. We'll see as the apostles speak in tongues. Was it shamalabalabada? Zabalabaza, what did I do? What did I just say? I have no idea and I can tell you this, that's not speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues according to the Bible is a known language that the hearers can understand. I have a difficult time speaking English, okay? The apostles spoke with other tongues, languages, as the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, gave them utterance or enabled them. We need to recognize that only the twelve here, the twelve apostles of Christ, even though it's not specifically stated here, this is Holy Spirit baptism. This is where the 12 apostles were overwhelmed 
immersed in the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that it was miraculous power that enabled them as they went out to the whole world. Well, here's a man that speaks a language I don't know. What am I going to do? The Holy Spirit empowered them to speak perfectly in that language. Now, there's the preparation of the apostles where it empowered them by baptism of the Holy Spirit to preach the word. Now, let's look here in verses 5 through 13, and we won't read all this. But we'll see there were some 15 different nations here. And incidentally, of those 15 or so different nations, there were about 12 different languages. Now, how many apostles were empowered with the Holy Spirit? Twelve. And they were all preaching the same gospel. Verse number 5, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men. How were they devout? Well, they were devout to Judaism. There were three religious feasts required of males every year, those who were under the law of Moses. Pentecost was one. Passover was another one. And the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, was the third. And again, with Pentecost only being 50 days after Passover... So when these people came, they probably came for Passover and just stayed all the way through Pentecost. So that's how they were devout. They were devout to Judaism and taking the sacrifice needed to get there. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this, this what? That sound. The apostles speaking in languages that they obviously had never studied. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because, now look. The apostles were speaking in tongues in verse 4, were they not? Now look, they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Do you see that? Is that what the Bible says? Tongues were known languages. Not that foolishness I did a few minutes ago. Verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled. Now somebody in here is still going to say, Brock, you crazy. It was the 120. Let's see what the Bible says, all right? They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Were they not Galileans? Who was speaking? Galileans. The apostles were all, and obviously Matthias also, from Galilee, the northern part of Palestine. Do you see that? Verse number 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, in our own language, wherein we were born. And then there's a list of nations there. And look at verse number 12. And they were all amazed. Now understand about Galilee. There was no school of higher learning in the land of Galilee. And they said, are not all these which speak Galileans? How'd these boys figure that out? They didn't go to school and learn all that. They were miraculously empowered by God Almighty. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? How do you explain this? Some are going to mock, as we see. Some are going to say, We hear them proclaim the wonderful works and words of God. What was the purpose of these miracles? It got their attention. It softened their hearts. When you see a man, for example, like me, you hear the draw in my voice, I can't hide it. Could you imagine if I were to speak fluent, perfect Russian? You'd say, there's something wrong with that man. He didn't learn that in South Carolina. Wherever he got that. He didn't learn that in Piedmont Triad. Where's he from? How'd he get that? And of course, miracles are not going to occur. But it's the same effect here. Now, we've seen the preparation in the first place of the apostles and also of the people. Their hearts were softened by hearing these 12 men speak fluently and perfectly in languages, known languages, that they knew they could not have studied. Now, number two. Let's talk about some preaching here. Let's ask the question, how do I call on the name of the Lord? Well, let's find out. And let me give you this information. Acts 2 fulfills, at least in part, if not totally, Isaiah 2 and Daniel 2. And as we'll see Peter quote from Joel 2. So if you wonder what some of the Old Testament is about, look in Acts 2. And they'll tell you what those prophets saw. The establishment of the kingdom. Now look at verse 14. But Peter standing up with what? The 120? Did Peter stand up with 120? What does the Bible say? The Bible says Peter standing up with the 11. These men of Galilee. Lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, Be this known unto you 
and hearken to my words. Now do you see that? The miracle was not so that they could be converted miraculously. The miracle was to get their attention so they could communicate by means of words, what must I do to be saved? How do I call on the name of the Lord? What do you need this morning? Do you need anything? I promise you, you need the remission of your sins. Now watch. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's probably about 9 a.m. That's Roman time. But look at verse number 16. But this, Acts 2, is that, Joel 2, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Let me boil down Joel 2, 28 through 32, and that's what Peter quotes here. What Joel saw was the outpouring of miraculous gifts upon all flesh. What's all flesh? Does that include dogs? No. It's Jew and Gentile. The Jews would receive an outpouring of miraculous gifts, which they did. These 12 men of Galilee did, didn't they? But it would also be upon the Gentiles. The Gentiles received miraculous gifts from God. Now let me make this clear. Bible miracles happen. They're real. This occurred. But they no longer occur. So miraculous gifts were temporary in and of their nature, even though they occurred. There's Joel's prophecy. You can read through that yourself. God would pour it out upon all flesh, Jew and Gentile. And it was not a problem for a female to have a miraculous gift, incidentally. Unless you can explain Philip's daughters some other way. Philip's daughters prophesied. Is that not miraculous? Well, indeed they did. But now let's look down in Acts 2 and verse number 21. And this is the last part of Peter quoting Joel. Peter says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this, Acts 2, what you're seeing, is that Joel 2. Here at least is the beginning of of the fulfilling of what Joel said. Now look at verse 21 of Acts 2. And it shall come to pass that whosoever. Do you qualify to fall under the whosoever? Yes, you do. If you are of the age of accountability and of a sound mind, you fit in whosoever. Do you need to be a Jew? No. Do you need to be a Gentile? No. You need to be a human being. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, what does the Bible say? Shall be saved. Question. Now as we go down through this sermon, as we finish this chapter, let's see. If I were to ask you, how do I call on the name of the Lord? Somebody's going to tell me, I need to pray Jesus into my heart. Let's see where Peter tells anybody to pray Jesus into their heart. All right? Is that, is that fair? Let's go through this chapter and let's see if Peter will answer the question of how we call on the name of the Lord and thereby be saved. Is that fair? I think it's fair. Now, in verses 22 through 28 here, we're going to see Jesus preached. And the point here is that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And the resurrection of Christ, when you go through the book of Acts, is the focus of apostolic preaching. We don't talk too much about resurrection. We talk a lot about Jesus' death. They talked a lot about his resurrection because he is a pattern, a prototype for every human being. Acts 2.22, watch how to preach. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Do you see that? Jesus was a man and God. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. You know this. You saw him. Him, verse 23, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Oh, it's wrong to preach on people's sins. You can't call out a bunch of people that you know's done anything wrong and say you sin. What does Peter do? What does he say here? He didn't say he was just crucified. Does he say that? He says, ye have taken. You all took him. And by wicked hands have crucified and slain. If that's not preaching on specific sins by specific people, what is it? We say we need to be positive. We need to be encouraging. I agree, the Bible's that way. But there's a time where you have to preach on sin. Peter got up and preached on their specific sin. You killed Jesus. You did it. Now look at verse 24. 
whom God, that's Jesus of Nazareth, hath raised up. You killed him, but you can't keep him in the ground. God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible to be holden of him. Do we see that? And as we go on down through this, Peter proves by taking Psalm 16, 8 through 11, that David, number one, was the inspired writer of that psalm, and number two, that David was not speaking of himself. When David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen Psalm 16 as we know it, David was not talking about himself. I want to point out one thing. Look at verse 27. Those who read the King James Version, we need to clear this up, I think. Because, Acts 2.27, thou wilt not leave my soul in, the King James says, hell. Did Jesus go to hell, Gehenna hell, the final resting place, if you want to call it that, of the devil and his angels and all the wicked? No. Jesus went to Hades. Hades has two compartments. Basically, the upper half would be Abraham's bosom. When Jesus died, he went to Hades, but specifically Abraham's bosom. He did not go into the lower compartment, from lack of a better term, called Tartarus or Torment. Jesus did not go to where there is fire and brimstone. Did I make that clear? He went to the Hadean realm, which is the realm of all the dead. Literally, it would be the unseen world. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Here's what I want to impress upon your minds. Peter and the other apostles, by implication, are impressing the fact it cannot be David. And we'll see David was right there. There's his sepulcher. His body has seen corruption. It's impossible for David to be the Messiah. It has to be Jesus. Now, let's see verses 29 through 36 here where Jesus is exalted and only the Messiah fits. And Jesus is the only one who fits the qualifications to be the Messiah. Do you need anything today? Do you need anything? I promise you, you need your sins forgiven. This is gospel preaching. Verse 29, Peter says, Men and brethren, let me freely, that is boldly, speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried. He is dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. They knew that David's body was somewhere there in Jerusalem and it was buried. Now let's continue reading. Therefore, being a prophet, that's David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath unto him that of the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ, the Messiah, to sit upon his throne. David's throne, as we've gone through the Old Testament, is the same as Jehovah's throne. They're one and the same. Jehovah's throne is in heaven and always was. He's seeing this before, verse 31, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, that is, Hades in Abraham's bosom, neither did his flesh see corruption. David automatically disqualifies. He automatically disqualifies because Peter says, there's his grave. His body is in there and it has seen corruption. David is not the Messiah. Who is it? It's Jesus and it's irresistible. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Now in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, it took the testimony of two or three witnesses to make something true, and here's a dozen. There's a dozen competent witnesses who spent three to three and a half years in close association with Jesus, and they're saying, we saw it. We saw him. We handled him. Isn't this amazing? Now watch. How are you going to call on the name of the Lord? Therefore, conclusion based on evidence, being by the right hand of God exalted. That's not David. David's flesh has seen corruption. His body has not been raised incorruptibly. Being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he now, what? See and hear, or first he has shed forth this, that's the promise of the Holy Ghost, miraculous gifts, which he now see and hear, for David is not ascended into the heaven. Now, some of us will miss this, but 3,000 people got it. They understood. What are we going to get? 
David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. There's no way anyone could be David's Lord except God. David answered to no one. And David says, Jehovah said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The only person who qualifies is the Messiah. The only person who fits the qualifications of the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. Not Mohammed. Not Harry Krishna. Not any other person you'll ever find in all of history. Only Jesus of Nazareth. That's good stuff. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Preach on them, Peter. Let them know. That God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, that's how you preach. How do I call on the name of the Lord? Where was the answer given? We haven't seen it yet, have we? Well, let's go on to number three. Let's talk now about pardon and placement. Let's see what Peter says. Let's see where the pardon comes in. Verse 37. Does anyone need forgiveness? There's no one who needs anything in regard to forgiveness until you feel guilty over sin. What did Peter do? You killed Jesus. You need to feel bad about that. You need to know that you did this. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they paid attention. They didn't go to sleep while he preached. They didn't snuggle up in a padded pew and rub elbows with their spouse. They were cut to their heart. They were pricked to their heart. And said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do you see that? I learned from Melvin Sapp. When you preach it right, they'll ask you. You don't have to go around and try and say, Oh, we need to get people to obey the God. No, 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 no. We preach the word. And when the honest and good heart receives it, they'll ask. What did the Ethiopian eunuch do in Acts 8? What did he do? He stopped Philip and said, Oh, here is what. What does enter me to be baptized? When's somebody going to stop me in mid-sentence and say, time out, I got it. I see it. I see what I need to do to be saved. Look at Acts 2.38. You want to know how to call on the name of the Lord? Here's your answer. Let's see what Acts 2.38 says and see where he says, pray Jesus into your heart. Where does he say it? Then Peter said unto them, what shall we do? I'm cut. I'm convicted. I need this gone. Repent. Change your mind. Change your mind in regard to sin and sinful conduct. Repent and be baptized. Be baptized in what? In Holy Ghost? Oh, no, 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 no. It's water. Read the rest of the book of Acts. Be baptized in water. Does it mean be immersed in Jesus? No. The apostles and maybe others administered Water baptism. Does that mean they took water and poured it on their head? The word baptized means immerse, to totally cover. It does not mean to sprinkle or pour. That's impossible. Repent and be baptized. How many of you? Every one of you. Every one of you. By whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? Why do I need to repent? Why do I need to be baptized? Because I'm already saved? Because I've already called on the name of the Lord. Where's the Bible say that? This is how we call on the name of the Lord. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for. In order to. The remission of sins. That word does not point backward. Because would be backward. This Greek word points this way. Into. Into the remission of sins. Why would we repent and be baptized? What is the purpose of baptism? Valid scriptural baptism in the New Testament under what we call the Great Commission is in order to receive remission of sin. Not because you're already saved. In order to be saved. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me give my opinion. That's miraculous gifts by the laying on of the hands of the apostles. Someone may say it's eternal life. Fine. Someone may say it's a non-miraculous bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Fine. I'm telling you. It was miraculous gifts by the laying on of the hands of the apostles that confirmed. That was another way God confirmed that message to them. And incidentally, 
Where were all these people going when they went back? They're going back home, wouldn't you say? What are they going home with? How are they going to know how to worship God in spirit and in truth? They got a miraculous gift. Now mess with it. Verse 39. For the promise. What promise? The gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Ghost. My opinion is miraculous gifts. The promise is unto you, Jews, and to your children, Jewish children, and to all that are afar off. That's the Gentiles. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Those who like to study and think that's the gospel call, go look it up. That's not the gospel call. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Totally different word. This is the call to service in the miraculous aspect. Verse 40, and with many other what? Words did he testify and exhort, saying what? The denominational world says we can't save ourselves. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. What does Peter say? What does he say? Save yourselves. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You have a part to play in your salvation. Did you know that? Either you will listen and obey or you'll sit right there and do nothing. And say, I don't need anything. I was baptized when I was seven years old at such and such a denomination. You lost. You lost because of sin. You have not had your sins remitted. Now, verses 41 through 47, we'll read some of this. But where are they placed? We'll see as we looked here in verse 41. Then they that madly Hardly, sadly, were they mad at were they mad at the preacher? Did they what did they do? Then they that gladly. What's there to be glad about? You can be forgiven. You can go home in Christ. These people got that. They needed something. Do you think they came to worship at Pentecost thinking that they needed anything? They thought they were fine. They thought everything was okay. You probably came in this building this morning saying, I'm fine. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Okay. The Bible is the one that determines that. Then they that were gladly received his word were baptized. They were immersed in water. And the same day they were added. They didn't have to wait till they got enough to qualify to go down to the river to baptize them. Right then. They didn't have to wait. When the people realized the message, they said, I'm ready. And the apostle said, guess what? So are we. We're ready too. The same day there were added unto them about how many? 3,000 souls. That's how you preach right there. Isn't it? What did he do? He simply preached the word. I want you to pay close attention. Verse 41, who was added? Who was added in verse 41? The baptized were added. Okay? Do you see that? Now, let's read on down in verse 42. And they, they who? Those who were added, continued steadfastly in the Mosaic law. That's not what the Bible says. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's gospel preaching. And fellowship. You can make the case that's a contribution. And in breaking of bread. You can make the case that's the Lord's Supper. And in prayers. How you miss that one? There are four of the five avenues of worship right there. And that's no specific order to those brethren who might think so. Now, remember in verse 41, who was added? The baptized were added. Now let's look at verse 47. Where were they placed? Praising God and having favor with all the people. When the gospel went out, Peter preached this sermon. Therefore, a limited amount of time, everybody loved the gospel. Everybody said, man, that's right. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It's scriptural. It's right. They had favor with all the people for a little while. But look how the verse continues. And the Lord added. There's our word added. Do you see it? Where were they placed? Added to the church. Where does the Bible teach join the church of your choice? Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say one church is good as another? Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say pray Jesus into your heart and that's how you call on the name of the Lord? How long halt ye between two opinions? If Jehovah is God, serve him. Do what's right. Added by
by the Lord to the church daily, such as should be what? Now, in verse 41, the baptized were added. Is that right? Now look at verse 47. Who was added in verse 47? The saved were added. How do you miss it? You need help. Therefore, the conclusion is the baptized are the saved. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. If the baptized are added and then the saved are added, the baptized have to be the saved. Baptized for what purpose? For the remission of sins. Where does God place everyone? Everyone who has received pardon. Where does God place everyone that has received remission of sins? In the church. Not a church. The church. What have we talked about? We talked about the hub of the Bible. The hub of the Bible is Acts 2. Everything is pointing to this. And when you read on, everything points back to that. We've seen the preparation of the apostles and of the people. We've seen preaching. The miracles of the apostles explained. Jesus resurrected. Jesus exalted. And then we talked about pardon and placement. If I were to ask you the moment before you came in here to sit down, what must you do to be saved? You probably would not have told me that. Listen carefully. If you figured out that baptism is immersion in water and has to be in order to be saved from me, you're lost. You're lost. I don't say that with joy in my heart, but I do say it with joy in this aspect. You don't have to be lost. You don't have to go home in your sins. You can make it right today. We must all call on the name of the Lord in order to be saved. Where did Peter tell anyone to pray Jesus into their hearts? He didn't. What did he say to do? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For in order to receive the remission of your sins. Saul said it this way. As he was quoting Ananias. Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. What doth hinder you to be saved? Only you. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Hear the truth, believe the truth, repent of sin, confess the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, be immersed in water for the remission of sins and the Lord will add you to his church, the churches of Christ. Romans 16, 16. Come now. As together we stand, as we sing the song of encouragement.